I'm not anti-Semitic against Jewish people or against their right to believe in Judaism if they choose to, just like people have the right to believe in Hinduism or Islam or any other religion. If that's what they choose, they have the right to do it. Do I believe any of those systems will help them find a relationship with God through Jesus? No. But they still have the right to believe what they want to believe. Hopefully, they will eventually come to the knowledge of the truth and realize that Jesus has come to bring them into a relationship with God, you know, in, a, in an intimate way. Um, so I would want all Jewish people, Palestinian people, hin Hindu people, followers of any religion and none to come to know the truth, which is a person. And in finding that truth, they will enter into a relationship with the Father through him. Yesterday, I was listening to your video regarding Hebrew roots, and it was, yeah, it was quite interesting to listen to it because so many people get caught into this movement, right? So it, it's so easy kind of to get astray. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, the whole thing is, is quite difficult this, in terms of the subjects. Um, in that... It, it sounds so plausible. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but when you when you look at it from a, a even a logical perspective, in one sense, it's like we're we're not Hebrew. Um, the New Testament is is not based on um, Hebrew or based on Jewish and Gentile separation. You know, there is one new man in Christ, as Paul described in in Ephesians. And that is Jew and Gentile coming together as one new man in Christ, which really mm -hmm. says those that have come out of the old covenant have to come into the new covenant. And the new covenant includes everybody. Um, so the new covenant is God's covenant made with Jesus for the salvation of the whole world. You know, and therefore you, you have to leave the old. And I think people don't realize that Jesus was talking to um, many people who were operating in the old covenant system of his day and he was trying to get them to follow him out of that system so when you read sort of matthew mark and luke this what's called the synoptic gospels uh, most of what jesus is addressing is addressing in the context of an old covenant thinking so he can help them leave that old covenant thinking and come into a new covenant relationship um, and therefore people get this view that well everything that the bible says is speaking to us directly today and actually isn't um, jesus was speaking to those jewish people followers of judaism in his day and of course he loved them and he wanted it says that he wanted to gather like a hen gathers his chicks under the wing that that was what his desire and of course he wanted everyone to follow him into a relationship with the father and of course today you know that is still his desire he still wants everyone to come into a relationship with the father um, and he's done everything necessary to accomplish that um, but when he was talking to those people at the time and he was talking to those Jewish believers at the time. Um, he wasn't talking to us. You know, John's gospel is a very different revelation. And it is the revelation of the new covenant in which Jesus revealed himself in a new covenant relationship as the way, the truth and the life, as, you know, the resurrection in the life, you know, as the door to the sheep, you know, the good shepherd you know, they were all terms that revealed his true nature as as the son of God um, in a way to help us understand what the new covenant would be in a relationship with the father through him. And he said, you know, no one can come to the father but through me, but he's opened the door for everyone to come to the father. Um, so from Paul's perspective, looking at what Jesus had done and from the revelation that Paul received on his salvation, and he describes that in, in Galatians 1.16, 
It's that the father was pleased to reveal his son in me, you know, and has given me this essentially mission to preach Christ in the Gentiles. So, and Paul described his own Jewish roots and everything that he was as a Pharisee of a Pharisees and all of those things, he described it as dung. It's like this was no use to me at all in this new covenant relationship. And he then entered into that relationship by uh, acknowledging that Jesus was Lord uh, already at work in his life, that he had been resisting trying to follow his Jewish upbringing. But that was resisting Jesus um, in that Jesus was leading everyone into a new way into a new relationship so paul had that revelation he described it as a heavenly vision and a heavenly mission um but he then went preaching christ in the gentiles not saying the gentiles were outside but actually god was already at work in everybody so paul's message was one of inclusion where everyone was included in what jesus had done um they just didn't know it yet um so paul's understanding of his history and the value of his history was really trying to help the gentiles understand well why 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 are these people trying to get us back under a law that we were never under in the first place um and of course paul didn't um didn't agree with what those were doing in jerusalem and even when he went to Jerusalem and he sort of was expressing and sharing that this message had gone out to the Gentiles, um, you know, when they said, well, OK, they need to, you know, not take meat sacrifice to idols and you know, these sort of basic things. Um, Paul just basically ignored them. And when Peter came um, to meet with him and was fellowshipping with but just Gentile believers. Um, then when Judaizers came from Jerusalem, Paul separated himself from them and, and well, Paul, sorry, Peter did, and Paul called him a, a hypocrite, you know, for, for that. Because there was no separation. There were not two groups anymore. There was just one group of people who were included in Christ. Um, so we have this um, understanding that how jesus was trying to help them understand that this system had no value and was coming to an end and would end within that generation fully and and he was preparing those to follow him into this new relationship with the father um, through the door he'd opened um, but the hebrew roots movement today has a mission to get people back following the hebrew roots that most people never had and therefore learning hebrew trying to understand hebrew trying to follow the feasts and the festivals of the old testament which jesus actually had already fulfilled and he is the total fulfillment of all of those types and shadows because that's what they were now he is the real why would we want to go back to a type and shadow or following something when we have the real and Jesus instituted a completely new and different way for us. And so the Hebrew Roots movement is trying to get people back under a, a law-based system, which is going to bring them back under bondage. When Paul very clearly said to the Galatians, you foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? You started out in grace and now you want to go back under a law that effectively you can't keep. Um, so Paul was very, very clear that there was only one group of believers and those were those who were included in christ which actually included all the jewish believers they just didn't accept it and follow jesus jesus had died for them they were included in his death and resurrection and ascension just as much as everyone else is but they failed to follow that therefore they were living in the blindness that paul was living in as saul before he met jesus on the damascus road in the light and then everything changed for him so jesus has completed the work it is finished and it is available to all but not all choose 
to enter into it. And unfortunately, that means they're living less than kind of lives. They're not living the life of a son. They're living the life of a slave or a servant or a steward or all the other things that they're trying to do in serving religion. Um, so it is quite difficult um, for people um, who've been conditioned into following that to accept that they're free. And there is a, an agenda to get people back under Noahide laws. And if you sort of look up and Google Noahide laws, they're literally laws that would bring everyone under the control of Judaism. Um, and this is a very dangerous thing um, and not something that Christians should be supporting at all, really. Um, but I understand there's a sort of gray area that um, people are being drawn into with with i think promises that you'll get a deeper relationship with god with understanding the hebrew roots of christianity well actually the old testament has nothing to do with the new you know uh, and we need to realize that our we don't have to have hebrew roots we are all included in jesus yeah and paul made it pretty clear what his view was in terms of well who were the people of god and even in later on in in sort of uh, peter describes well, look you were once not a people and now you are the people of god you are a royal priesthood a holy nation as opposed to israel being a royal priesthood and holy nation which they saw themselves under the old covenant but even peter de decreed that no, it's actually those who are in Christ who are now this royal priesthood, this holy nation. And Paul also says, look, you were aliens from the Commonwealth of Israel. But now that middle wall of partition has been removed. So they're now one, one new man in Christ. Um, and we have this understanding um, which has been sort of clear for a long time and now it's sort of starting to get obscured with the rise of the hebrew roots movement trying to get people back under the deception of the bondage of the law you know and i think very clearly when you look at paul's statements of who he considered the people of god who he actually called the israel of god because we got to understand that the terminology in those days in this transition period was confusing to Gentiles and Jewish people were still calling themselves God's people. And ultimately today, this whole sort of Christian Zionist movement would still call Israel the earthly people of God and the church is the heavenly people of God. And they're separating what Paul said was one new man. And they're trying to separate it again into two groups where there is only one group um, and for that sense there is there are believers in what jesus has done and there are people who are not yet believers in what jesus has done but jesus has still done everything necessary for those people even though they don't believe it yet but hopefully and i believe eventually all people will come to the knowledge of the truth and accept what jesus has done willingly um and enter into that wonderful relationship with the father um but you know it is a, a difficult situation and i've had lots of comments from people on the basis of that uh video which actually were mostly very positive in that they have had experience with those groups and find them very legalistic and bringing you under a bondage and under under sort of a very strong doctrinal controlling system but beyond that, there is an agenda to get the whole world back under a Hebrew kingdom. That the world is dominated by Jewish people in Jerusalem under a religious system. And I'm not talking about, you know, Jewish people as opposed to any other one else. Uh, I got no issue with Jewish people, you know they have the right to believe whatever they want to believe and that that's their right and they do believe what they believe 
uh, my desire is they would come to know the truth of the, who their true Messiah is in Jesus and find the truth of what they were looking for or are still looking for in a Messiah. And it's not going to be an earthly Messiah that it's going to restore natural Israel to be the controlling system of the world. Jesus, the kingdom of God, will fill the earth. Um, and we have this sort of whole misnomer of, uh, I guess, you know, Zionists who believe in a state of Israel and that they are God's people. And then you've got Christian Zionists who believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but they believe that there's an earthly people. The is Israel is the earthly people of God. You know, um, now, they don't, for me, they just do doesn't work. And the root of that teaching comes from the same source that brought the teaching about the rapture and brought the teaching about the millennium, comes from dispensationalism, which comes from brethrenism. And it's really only been around for a couple hundred years. You know, it's not it's not it's not a thing that goes right back to the early church. This is something which has been a few hundred years, but has infected a lot of Christian Western theology. Uh, but people are awakening to the reality that that isn't the truth. You know, sadly, so many people are still caught under that and they become susceptible to this two part belief in an earthly and a heavenly people and then an earthly kingdom you know which is under a messiah but the sort of political zionists and religious zionists are looking for an earthly messiah who would be jewish and who would restore the kingdom to israel which was the question that jesus disciples asked him when will you restore the kingdom to israel well the kingdom was never going to be restored to israel it was going to be a kingdom which encompassed the whole world and everybody, not just one group of people. Um, so they also were deceived when they asked that question. And of course, Jesus basically didn't answer it in the affirmative. Well, I'm going to restore it here. He really basically um, says you're asking the wrong question, really. Um, so we have a very difficult uh, scenario and we've got people who are involved in the mystic movement seem to be getting drawn into a lot of Hebrew roots stuff without really understanding or knowing about it or knowing what the agenda is behind it. But they're drawn into it. Uh, and, you know, you've got modern day people calling themselves rabbis who are, you know, taking up a rabbinical position of teaching Hebrew understanding and people who are feeling they need to go and have prayer talis or wear kippers on their head or go back under jewish cultural and religious things whereas that's what jesus came to set us free from you know, so we would never be under a religious bondage but into a relationship with god so it's, it's quite a you know a difficult subject and i know it sort of helped people get very upset about certain things but, you know, I'm not anti-Semitic against Jewish people or against their right to believe in Judaism if they choose to. Just like people have the right to believe in Hinduism or Islam or any other religion. If that's what they choose, they have the right to do it. Do I believe any of those systems will help them find a relationship with God through Jesus? No. But they still have the right to believe what they want to believe. Hopefully, they will eventually come to the knowledge of the truth and realize that Jesus has come to bring them into a relationship with God, you know, in, a, in an intimate way. Um, so I would want all Jewish people, Palestinian people, hin Hindu people, followers of any religion and none to come to know the truth, which is a person. And in finding that truth, they will enter into a relationship with the Father through him. Um, and so that would be my desire. So I'm not against anyone uh, religiously or, and again, politically. People can follow whatever political system they want. You know, it doesn't mean I agree with it. Um, you know, and I what I don't believe in is that the view that Israel and Jewish people are God's people gives them the excuse to do whatever they want against Palestinian people or any other people. Because I don't think, 
you know, and this is where I think the problem lies in that Christian Zionists believe it's OK for Jewish people to defend their land and essentially commit genocide, which I don't believe it would ever be OK, even if they were God's people to do that, because Jesus came to reveal a new way, love, forgiveness. Love your enemies. Yeah, absolutely. Yesterday I was thinking about it. Like, can you imagine Jesus taking the rifle and going to defend his land? How can you even picture this, right? So how can you justify these things? And when you hear, um, probably, you know, kind of some people think, yeah, if going back to feasts, yesterday when I was listening to your video, so you, you touch based on feasts as well. Um, and some people probably think, if Jesus honored feasts, if uh, if he followed all these rules, so kind of we should follow in, in his steps, right, and follow this. Mm -hmm. And for some people it could be convincing, but it, it totally makes sense what you're saying, that new, new man, right? So let's say if Gentiles now want to look at their best half and start learning feasts and honoring them and all these Hebrew roots. So why don't this best half not look at this half, right? And start learning the same things, same cultural roots and all this stuff, right? So to amalgamate everything, integrate everything into one man, right? So Yeah, and I mean basically Jesus came to fulfill the the law and the prophets in a way that unveiled them as not true you know it's like jesus came as the express image of the father to reveal true nature of god and show them that they never needed to follow a system in the first place but he did accept that and he came into that culture and to reach that culture he lived in that way but that doesn't mean he was condoning everyone else having to live that way. And then he actually broke that culture by continually mm -hmm. saying, well, your rabbis say this, but I'm saying to you this. So you've heard a, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. No, I'm saying unto you something totally different. Love your enemies. Bless them. You know, don't hold these things because this is something you have been taught. But this was never God in the first place. This was your rabbinical tradition of your understanding. This was never the truth. You know, and I think that's the problem. People think because Jesus did this, then we should do that. And that isn't the case at all, because we're not living in an old covenant situation. We belong to the new covenant, the eternal covenant in that sense. You know, so I understand it's a very difficult thing because we're trying to understand the bible as a book written to us today when actually the bible was not written to us today it was written to people thousands of years ago for a particular purpose for particular situations you know it was never designed to be written and as a manual two thousand years later that we're supposed to live by we have the holy spirit living in us and we have jesus jesus as the truth to lead us into the way of life, to follow him, you know, not to follow the teaching of a book. Jesus didn't come to bring about a new set of teachings we should follow, although he did teach. And I'm not saying he didn't share some things, but most of what he was teaching was based under the old covenant. Then what he was saying in the new was all summed up in one very simple statement. Love one another as I have loved you. You know, and that was not a commandment, which was a law, but a goal to enter into, you know, and that's unfortunately, again, the, the translation commandment is a very bad translation of that word. You know, it wasn't a command. You must do this. As we think in English, a command means you must follow my command. This was here is the goal of entering into this relationship that you will be able to love others as I have loved you. And the word entoli in Greek 
is a in goal or the end result of something. And so by being loved, the end result is we will love each other and be empowered to love each other by the fact that we have been loved in an unconditional way. Yeah, and that is what Jesus was really trying to get over to them. You know, and the Bible in was talking about mostly about the end of the age that they were living in and the full embracing the new age which was coming you know and jesus introduced that new age and the fullness of that new age when obviously the old temple one temple one holy of holies in one nation on earth then we are now the new wine skin we are now the temple of the holy spirit god dwells in all and the whole world is where he is dwelling within all of us not in one place in one city in one nation um in one restricted way that you had to have one priest that could go in and meet with god now we're all priests we are all a royal priesthood we all have access to god uh, in that relationship so it, it's quite difficult when christianity is based in its beliefs on a book that really isn't referring mostly to today you know there is truth you know absolutely there's truth there and there's truth that are universal truth uh, but primarily what it's talking about was this is the the situation you're in the the end of the age is coming you need to get ready you need to be prepared um, and obviously those in Jerusalem needed to know when this was going to happen. And Jesus gave them a whole lot of signs. And then the final sign, when you see armies coming to surround Jerusalem, leave, run to the hills. You know, so the context was very different from what people have been told that this is talking about the end of the world sometime in the future. You know, so the last days, the last day you know, the day of resurrection, the day of judgment was was not the end of the world. It was the end of their world. And this is what the thing, their world was the temple system. Their world was that covenantal system. But it wasn't the world as we know it as that word, you know, and it didn't mean that word. You know, it was the end of the age for them, their age of government had come to an end and now we're entering into this new age of the kingdom of god um, which was fully established when jesus came but then had to work through that transition where the old was still there and the new had come so here's the old temple still in in place and here's the new us people filled with god's presence and then of course jesus said and warned them this old temple the heavens and the earth literally is what the, the they called it was going to be not one stone was left standing on another and this was all going to happen within a generation and it did happen within a generation and the temple was destroyed and therefore there is no temple to sort of falsely proclaim it is the system when you have this open thing where all of us are temples of the Holy Spirit and God dwells within all man and all men can come to that knowledge of that truth and enter into a relationship with him without having to go through a mediation system of earthly mediation. Jesus is the one mediator between God and man. And we enter through him into our open relationship with God without having to go through any rules, regulations, religious systems or any other mediation we have direct access and jesus basically encouraged us that we are his sheep and we can hear his voice and he will keep speaking to us and we need to follow him mm -hmm. that's, that's that so you know all of this type of thinking is part of the issue with it is because of our using the bible in a way that says well everything in it is god speaking to us today and it really isn't you know and if we didn't use the bible in that way uh, and we didn't see the bible as the primary way that god speaks to people today as well this is god's word the bible is not god's word 
the Bible does contain some words that God said, but it's not God's word. Jesus is God's word. You know, he is the Logos of God. He is the word made flesh. He was with God in the beginning. And when we see that Jesus is the word of God, then you look at the Bible. And every time it says the word word. We're conditioned into thinking that must mean the Bible. Well, it doesn't because the Bible didn't come about until about 385 A.D. And in 325 A.D. at the Council of Nicaea, they chose a whole load of what they called Holy Roman Scriptures, which were the accepted things that God was speaking to them through. They called them essentially scriptures, writings, um, and they chose a group and they excluded other things. And so then they chose again in, in 385 to canonize a group of scriptures and call them a Bible and then basically say, well, God can't speak any more now which of course he can he's speaking to us all day or every day you know but that was then what they call the canon of scripture now people don't understand that that canon of scripture and i was talking to a guy the the other day and sort of saying to him look you know do you you know do you know where the bible came from well yes it came from i said okay so you're saying that a group of people were inspired by God to choose what would be in the Bible. Yes. So, well, why did they choose 13 other books which were in the original Bible, which the Protestants have thrown out? So if you said they were authorized to say what was in the Bible and what was inspired to call the Bible, why is the Bible changed? So why is the Apocrypha so-called by Protestants in the Catholic Bible, which isn't in the Protestant Bible? Who authorized the removal of those books from the Bible when you're saying that God inspired those people to put that in the Bible? So, you know, it makes no sense. You know, and God never required a book. God wanted to speak to us directly with the spirit within us as the one who would teach us and that we would then and i'm not saying that those aren't interesting things and they're not useful in one sense but if we didn't have it where would we be now probably not Definitely. divided not separated up into all these belief systems and all these denominations that are all denominated on their set of beliefs because they wouldn't have had a set of canonized verses to base their belief on they could have actually followed jesus and every generation i believe should have their own holy writings or writings which are inspired and they should help every generation but they shouldn't be canonized and they shouldn't be oh god has stopped speaking now and i said to this guy well why why do you think god stopped speaking and the bible is complete well, because it says in Revelation that you shouldn't add anything to this book. Yeah, but that book wasn't the Bible. It was the Revelation, a letter. So don't add to this letter because it's the last book in the Bible. People read that and in immediately think, oh, it's saying you shouldn't add anything else to the Bible. But it doesn't say that at all and doesn't mean that at all. But there's a huge conditioning into it, you know, and you know, in 2 Timothy 3.16, where it says every inspired writing is useful for doctrine and other things. It is. But it doesn't say what is inspired writings. And it obviously wasn't talking about the Bible as we know it, because that was 300 odd years before the Bible was actually formed. So what was it talking about? Any inspired writing. And it, every inspired writing is going to be useful. But that has been mistranslated to all scripture is useful. But with a capital S on scripture, which people would interpret as the Bible. But it was no capital S. It didn't actually was written scripture. It said graphe in Greek, which is writings. So actually what it says is every inspired writing. 
Now, I believe that God has inspired writings right throughout history. And those writings are useful to help us in the generation in which we live. And I think we should have writings for our generation, which help us understand what God is doing in our generation, which is living and active and at working in our generation. But well, I don't think we should be following something written 2000 years ago as this is God's word. It is a collection of books written by people that contain God's word, that contain lots of other things, contain words of other people who are not God. Um, Pontius Pilate has his words in there. Other people have their words recorded in there. You have poetry and history recorded. You know, you have a lot of interesting things. And some of them are, I believe, absolutely inspired. And they're probably inspired by the person's relationship with God. But God didn't dictate it. God didn't dictate to David the Psalms. The Psalms were expression of David's relationship or the things that were going on in his life that he expressed and they were put to music. As in the other writers, God didn't dictate that. But they do express something of those people's relationship with God. But should we be following that today or should we be listening to God speak to us directly today? And I think that's really where where we should be um and i know you know it upsets a lot of evangelical people to suggest that the bible is not the word of god you know because they believe in sola scriptura scripture alone everything we do should be determined by scripture or the bible alone well where does that leave the spirit to direct us every day if we have to read the bible every day to tell us what to do every day no, we're led by the spirit and those who are led by the spirit are children of god not those who are led by the bible are children of god you and know. even with our notes right so when you have our relationship with god and so it's um it's true for you as well right so you journal right so you take notes what god is telling you right when you have your meditation time yeah. isn't it inspired notes inspired yes. writings yeah, yes. same, right? So and, and, and it's very true to you, right? For your situation. Yeah, I'm um, absolutely. But what I wouldn't say is that someone else has to follow my <laughs> writing. That's the thing. I'm not saying they are authoritative as God speaking to anyone else. They were God speaking to me. So they're authoritative to me because I believe mm -hmm in what god said and of course i would try and outwork what god said because he said it to me what i share with other people is up to other people to decide whether god's speaking to them through it but it's not actually directly god speaking to them god spoke to me and hopefully god will have spoken to each of us in different ways which will be inspired but also authoritative to our lives if god told me to do something i would take that as authoritative but i couldn't say you what god said to me and that's the difference we are telling people to follow what god said to paul and peter and john and other people two thousand years later and telling them you must follow this and we don't understand the context we don't understand the time we don't understand mostly the fact of the age is changing and all of the things that happen and therefore we're trying to fit into again the old testament which was written to jewish people under a different religious system and it's all this confusion about how to, well, what should we do and you then get the, the something like proverbs which were solomon writing things which he expressed as wisdom because god gave him wisdom but then we read that and we interpret it try today so like for instance spare the rod spoil the child which is created within evangelical circles a doctrine of you must discipline your children with a rod in other words spank them otherwise you'll spoil their lives so we're literally using a word there and interpreting rod under a modern interpretation rather than the rod was a shepherd's implement to correct and guide the sheep not beat them hence in psalm 23 your rod and your staff they comfort me 
They don't beat me. They comfort me. So you take a verse in the Old Testament, as in Proverbs, and you try and apply that today and you create a whole theology around you have to discipline your children with a rod or you have to spank them. Otherwise, they will be spoiled. Well, what does that say? Well, that's come from because they view God as someone who has punished Jesus through penal substitutionary atonement. They believe God punished Jesus. Therefore, we should punish our children. And unfortunately, that has been adopted because of a wrong view of God as that type of father who will punish his children. And if they don't follow him, they'll punish him forever in eternal conscious torment. That's that's literally what, why they believe all that, because it's a completely wrong view of God, which has created a understanding by using one Bible verse based on a wrong understanding of who God is as love to set up a thing. And then you get in Hebrews where it says, you know, do not despise the discipline of the Lord. And again, when you read the original translation of that, again, from Proverbs, you will find it doesn't say punish. Punishment isn't in there. Discipline and correction is, which is what God does. As a loving father, he corrects us and disciplines us or disciples us to follow the better path, which is him. He doesn't punish us. But people believe, because it says in Hebrews, in English, punish. But when you go back to the original verse that is quoted in Hebrews, it does not say punish at all. It's not there at all. It just says correct. Or chastise. Correct. Not punish. Um, and unfortunately, again, you know, just taking a verse written out of context or to translated out of context or interpreted out of context and applying it today means we're trying to live under a system that was based in writings which were sort of poetry and like Aesop's fables, stories that gave a point or Solomon's wisdom. But we've taken it and totally misunderstood it and misinterpreted it and therefore created a generation of Christians who beat their children. Because the Bible says they should. Sadly, that so misrepresents God. You know, and we therefore have believed that God will beat us. And does, you know, but he doesn't. He loves us and wants the best yeah. for us. And many, many kids were disciplined or punished. And um, so I was wondering, Mike, um, if I can ask a uh, so you were saying that you were engaging with um, different people from the Bible, from the scripture. But coming back to yourself, so for instance, um, have you ever engaged with yourself going back in time um, to that child, to that boy, and helped yourself, did something with yourself when you were a child? Did you uh, travel back in time to your childhood? Okay, I, I have known, I have got testimonies of people doing that. Um, and I have walked back into the memories of my childhood with Jesus to show me what happened in my childhood to things I could not remember and things that were hidden for me because they were dissociated from the memory and I couldn't remember it. It was a, a dark area that I couldn't see into. Jesus walked back and showed me what happened. And I've walked back with Jesus into memories where he has healed the memories and healed me of the results of what happened in the past. I can't say that I've traveled back to help myself, but I know of certainly one person who has. And I, he told me the story that he was engaging and going into that eternal now place. And he remembered uh, that when he was the first time he ever preached a sermon, he was so nervous that he, he just didn't feel that he was going to be able to do it. So he called out 
for help. He called out for God to help. And when he went into this encounter, he did go back and helped himself by encouraging and strengthening himself. And then the two memories, the one that was a childhood memory and the one which was an adult memory of him actually doing it, sort of were integrated. And they became, oh, I helped myself. Because he felt strengthened and encouraged supernaturally. But but at the time, didn't know it was himself, just thought, oh, God has helped me and was thankful for God helping him. But actually, he was able to go back and encourage and strengthen himself at that moment. So I definitely believe it's possible. And I believe we can definitely go back into the past. I don't think we can change it, but we can be involved in it. So he was always involved from because it's like you go into an eternal now then the past is accessible because it's now to you now even though it was history to them you've accessed it now so you go into 2024 and you access i don't know 2000 24 years ago you're only doing it in 2024 but because 2000 and the year 2000 was then you were used in the past you didn't change it but you were active in it and were used by god in it which has become history but you now only remember it because that's the moment where you entered into the eternal now and went back and did it but it's always it happened you didn't change it you were just used in it and i believe that is absolutely possible i've done that lots of times and i've been involved with god using me in the past sometimes just because he chose to because i was available and other times when i've sort of led an activation sometimes they will actually just be make ourselves available to god and see what god does see where he takes us and see what happens as a result of that and you know lots of testimonies of people saying that they were used by god to help people and lots often quite often children that god seems to respond to the cries of children and help children by sending people now he could have sent an angel he could have done it all sorts of different ways but he's chosen to use people who've made themselves available um so it's definitely possible and definitely something um that we can be involved in yeah but i asked it because so many things whatever happened in the past in your childhood right so and then um late in the life so the effect mm how you perceive things now right so and so much of trauma could happen there in the past mm. so i wonder if it's uh, a good way just to go back and uh, you know do something there heal yourself there whatever well i would could say, help you now i would say that if if that is what god directs you to do then yes would I try to just do it because I could? No, because I only want to do what I see the father doing. So if the father directed me into that, then yes. I've certainly walked back with Jesus into past childhood memories um, and have seen them healed and restored uh, and the trauma of things changed um, and being set free from it. That's definitely happened quite a lot. But I didn't do it on my own. Whereas I definitely went back in the past and did things as God directed me um, that just felt like me doing something. Um, but, you know, God's presence is always there. You don't you don't do something, you know, independently of him. But, yeah, I think it's certainly possible and something we should be open to if God directs you towards that. If it brings healing right if it brings um, freedom so absolutely mm -hmm. and ob obviously we whatever we do we do with with the father yeah yeah definitely well i wanted to ask you mike about something that um just kind of popped into my head as i was um reading revelations i was reading revelations 5 and he's talking about the scroll and opening the scroll and what came to my mind is that um we ourselves are that scroll and i just wanted to ask what your thoughts are about that have have you ever thought about that has it ever come across to you like that 
And um, please, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think I think from my perspective, there's like two scrolls. There's the scroll that's written of me by the Father, and it's the scroll of my destiny, of my identity. Mm -hmm. And there's the scroll, which is the record of my life and how I've lived. Some of that is lived according to my identity and destiny, and some of it isn't and hasn't been. So when I engaged um, the judgment seat of Christ and the fire of God's presence, I took a scroll of my life. And literally, obviously, it's me walking in there. But the scroll is a, something you can sort of relate to. Um, and of course, it talks about it being written front and back. Yes, the yes. Scroll, in a book, you know, we have both sides of the page have text on it. And the right. scroll can be written front and back. Right. So I went with this scroll to engage the father. And all I saw was basically a consuming fire, but his eyes. And the scroll was opened on the front side. And literally what I saw was wood, hay and straw and gold, silver and precious stones. So the things in my life as a believer, this is not like, before i was a believer because all the things in my life have already been accounted by the cross so what we call sin you know my lost identity and everything i did out of my yeah. lost life has already been forgiven already been cleansed so it wasn't that but what i was watching and what i was actually seeing was my life and what i had done with my life in in relationship with god and some of it there were things that I had done which were of a mixed motives. And some of it was me doing things to affirm my own identity and to essentially, I guess, validate myself from what I was doing. And they weren't wrong things, but the motive was definitely mixed. And, and he just completely consumed all of those things on that scroll, which the bible describes as wood hay and straw um but the gold silver and precious stones just shone and my scroll effectively all my life you could say because it's a record of my life had everything in it removed that was contradictory um in that way and there was no guilt no shame no condemnation attached to it just love so god's love consumed all of those things and then the scroll on the flip side of the scroll had again gold silver precious stones and wood hay and straw and that was all the things i'd done when i had sort of known the father's heart and outworked it and then all the things i had missed doing because i was not tuned into the father's heart and therefore didn't see what the father was doing and missed it and didn't do it and again he just in his love consumed all of that as because i started to regret missing all of that and as i was just starting to be sorrowful for regretting missing everything that i could have done aligned to the father's heart but i missed it because i wasn't paying attention or i was too busy or i was busy doing something else and just wasn't listening or wasn't sensing he just again consumed it so there was no guilt no condemnation just in love removed all of that from my life so i carried no regrets any longer or anything negative that could have condemned me or the enemy could have used to condemn me or i could have condemned myself as a result of it so he just totally consumed it all with the fire of his love and purified that scroll so purified my life you could say because it is a representation of my life because what he wants is my life to reflect who he says I am and who he made me to be, not who I've been shaped by the world I've been brought up in, by the culture I've been brought up in, by the religion I've been brought up in, by anything which would shape my thinking and my experiences based on a lost identity or a warped identity, because I think religion warps our identity 
Whereas God wanted to show me my true identity as a son of God so I could fully operate from my new true identity of who I always was in him. And he's continued to speak to me the vast some of his thoughts about me to reveal who I really am. You know, so I know who I am in relationship to him, but I don't know everything because there's still things he's revealing, you know, but that is a relationship. So who I am is revealed through relationship with the father in that that reveals my sonship and he continually purifies and refines my life to ensure nothing hinders my progressively coming into the knowledge of who i really am and living from that knowledge rather than living from my past um and you know i recognize that you know i missed so many things and i had so many mixed motives in that i was trying to work for my identity and and validate my identity and doing the things that god wanted me to do but there was mixture and the pure in heart will see god or perceive God and know God. So I didn't want mixture in my life. So he kindly and generously purified the record in my life and the memory in my life. And some things I no longer have memory of. Literally, the memory was completely removed from my, from me. So I can't even remember what those things were or are now. You know, which is just God's grace and mercy and wonderful love, really. If you enjoy these videos, would you please take a moment to like, comment and subscribe? It really does help. Thank you very much.